Will they shatter the glass ceiling? Women could soon be granted permanent commission in the army. The Supreme Court is hearing the case today. Tamil Nadu takes Karnataka out of court over the state's refusal to release more Kaveri water. The centre is also playing politics with an eye on Karnataka polls, charges Tamil Nadu. And the Nobel Prize for Literature is cancelled following a sexual assault scandal. It's Tuesday, May 8th. Women BSF bikers may have wowed Republic Day spectators this year and women officers leading contingents of all three services years earlier did make for great optics. But the issue of the roles and tenure of women in our armed forces is a far from settled one. The Supreme Court will today hear the government's appeal filed on behalf of the army against the Delhi High Court's 2010 ruling that directed it to give women army officers in the Short Service Commission permanent commission. In the last hearing, the centre had conveyed it as considering doing so. The Delhi High Court in its 2010 ruling had observed, if male officers can be granted permanent commission, there is no reason why equally capable women officers cannot. So, is there institutional resistance to women even in non-combat roles in the armed forces? Let's look at a brief history of women in the armed forces. In 1992, all three services allowed limited induction of women in a few non-combat branches, but only under the Short Service Commission. This was then for five years. The service tenure was subsequently extended to a maximum of 14 years. Following a legal battle for permanent commission for women officers in certain branches of the three services, the Accounts, Administration, Technical and Logistical Departments, for instance, in the Air Force, and the Constructor Branch of the Navy, the Judge Advocate General Wing and Army Education Corps of the Army was opened up. Women not serving in these departments had to leave after the 14-year short service commission tenure and are not eligible for pension, which requires a minimum 20 years of service. And as the PIL argues, their release comes at a juncture when they are still in their mid-30s and not trained for any other job. Earlier this year, flight cadets Bhavna Kant, Avni Chaturvedi and Mohana Singh became the Indian Air Force's first women fighter pilots, a fact referenced by the Supreme Court bench while hearing the case last month. It said, you advertise women in combat roles, fighter pilots and sea vessels and you're here opposing permanent commission of women officers. Meanwhile, those who argue in favour of integrated forces point to the fact that even the Central Reserve Police Force has deployed women commandos for anti-Maoist operations in Jharkhand. Women commandos of the Border Security Force patrol the border. Women are deployed as part of peacekeeping forces. The Supreme Court wants to move this debate beyond non-combat roles. In the last hearing, it has sought to know from the centre why it was not granting permanent commission to women army officers in combat roles and has asked it to file an affidavit. An indication of what that affidavit could state comes from the army's own affidavit filed in the matter in 2012. It essentially said that women officers might not live up to the role models that Jawans, mostly from rustic backgrounds, want their officers to be in combat situations. It said war has no runners-up, hence the need for an efficient war machine that will ensure victory. The interface between the leader and the led must be without any reserve or preconceived notions, especially in battle conditions where Jawans repose full faith in decisions or orders of the leader who is their role model and are prepared to make the supreme sacrifice in the line of duty. But isn't it natural there will be pushback when there is change? If we waited for society at large to play catch-up, would there ever be any real change aimed at bringing equity? Or are those that agree with the army's contention right when they say the mantle for political correctness should not be borne by the armed forces? It's a busy Tuesday for the Supreme Court. Tamil Nadu has moved the apex court against Karnataka after the state government told the Supreme Court it cannot release more Kaveri water as suggested by it. The affidavit said Karnataka has given more water than allocated to Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu has denied the claim. Last week, the Supreme Court had directed the Karnataka government to release 4,000 million cubic feet of Kaveri water to Tamil Nadu. 
The bench also warned Karnataka of consequences if it did not release Kaveri water to meet the urgent needs of Tamil Nadu. The court also pulled up the center for not finalizing the Kaveri scheme. Attorney General KK Venugopal told the bench that the Kaveri management board draft had to be tabled before the union cabinet. However, since Prime Minister Modi is in Karnataka for the upcoming assembly elections, the draft has not been approved yet. The court had earlier asked the Tamil Nadu and Karnataka governments to ensure there was peace in the states and rebuke the centre for ignoring its orders on setting up off the Kaveri management board. So is the May 12th assembly election in Karnataka framing the centre's response? It would appear so. Karnataka votes on the 12th of May and the Congress government there has rejected the idea of a Kaveri water management board or scheme to oversee the sharing of the water in the Kaveri basin. Why so? Karnataka does not want to give up control of the Kaveri water. When set up, the Kaveri Water Management Board will function independently to implement the water sharing arrangement by forming the Kaveri Water Regulation Committee, which in effect means Karnataka won't be able to deny water to other riparian states claiming poor rainfall, something it has been doing in the last few years. So Karnataka opposing the formation of the board has forced the hand of the BJP-led government at the centre in the light of impending elections. This in turn has led to political parties in Tamil Nadu accusing the centre of betraying the state. Scandal makes for great literature, but not a great literature prize. If you haven't already heard, there isn't going to be a Nobel for Literature this year. To make up, there will be two in 2019. The Prologue, a 20-year-old sex scandal starring French photographer Jean-Claude Arnaud, who is husband of Academy member Katerina Frostensen. Arnaud was accused of sexual assault by 18 women, including Sweden's crown princess Victoria. He allegedly swindled money from the Academy and even leaked the Nobel winner's name year after year. Swell guy. But... Sarah Daniels, the Academy's permanent secretary, refused to axe Frostensen for her husband's sins. That's when the fun began. Three members resigned in protest, then Daniels did, followed by more resignations, including Frostensen herself. The Academy could have voted for a prize, but they desperately needed a timeout. Epilogue. No prize this year. Unless, of course, we're rewarding one for drama. We almost thought we'd never hear them sing again, but these knobbly-headed, slightly sloppy, school bus-sized humpback whales, nearly hunted to extinction, are making a comeback in the waters around Antarctica. Snow leopards, sea otters, spider monkeys, ring-tailed lemurs, Asian elephant, they're all fine animals and all on the verge of extinction. That point where every member of an entire species is dead or literally wiped off the face of the planet. If things continue this way, we may only see animals in Madagascar. So, on a serious note, what happens when a species goes extinct? This is the food chain. Whether it is the African wild ass or the Indian olive ridley sea turtle, every organism has a special role in keeping our ecosystem in order. The food chain starts with producer organisms and ends with apex predator species. But not all of them have the capacity to disrupt Earth's biodiversity. Some of them are simply replaced by better or stronger species or fail to reproduce adequately before their predators get to them. This process is called natural selection. But this is not always the case with extinction. In the 20th century in Britain, the number of sheep grazing the fields fell. With no sheep feeding on them, the grass grew taller. This led to a fall in the population of red ants, which preferred short grass. The lack of red ants led to the extinction of large butterflies, which were feeding on the ants. And the lack of large butterflies endangered natural processes like pollination, which helped a species grow. Whether it is an apex predator or a producer organism, extinction or overpopulation of a species leads to a domino effect that can potentially destroy entire forests and kill the natural habitat of many species. In India alone, over 600 animal species and over 300 plant species are facing the risk of extinction. So, what can you do to help? Spare a thought and we'll meet you here again tomorrow.